Let them in. Okay, well, welcome everyone. We're gonna give it about 30 seconds just to let everyone else in. And I'm also gonna get this ready on Facebook. And we'll be ready to kick things off. Okay, well, welcome everyone today for uh, part one of our four-part series. We, Keith and I sat back and looked at all the webinars that we'd done and found that probably one of the most questions that came out of a webinar was the phosphorus paradox with Dr. Christine Jones and just had a lot of great comments, some really good feedback from people saying that was excellent, um, but it brought up a lot more questions. Uh, we needed some more in-depth details on a lot of the things that Dr. Jones is bringing up. And I know for me personally, it was, it kind of felt like you're peeling back a layer of an onion um, without knowing what the, the whole system is like. And I know that, uh, Christine, you've alluded to that as well, the, the jigsaw puzzle, you know, it's hard to see that whole picture. So we wanted to make this a more in-depth kind of series. So what we're going to do is focus on four different things each week. And um, we will have everything recorded. So if you have to miss any of these for any reason, they'll be on our website and on our YouTube page. Um, the other thing that we wanted to do was include more Q&A at the end of this and just provide more time for you guys to ask those questions that you have um, in addition to the longer presentation. So what we're gonna do is let Dr. Jones go for an hour till 6.30 and then we'll open it up to your audience questions. So if you have any of those, you can type those out in the chat bar um, and we'll go from there. With that, Keith, do you wanna go ahead and introduce our speaker. Yeah, thanks, Noah. Uh, well, like Noah said, you know, we're, we're just extremely proud and thrilled to have Dr. Christine Jones uh, not only be with us again, but to be with us for four sessions in a row. Uh, very excited about it. Many of you have heard Dr. Jones before, uh, and that's why we have so many people logging in. Uh, just absolutely one of the top soil microbiologists, soil ecologists in the world. Uh, she is from Australia. And uh, they are experiencing a little rain shower over there. So she's excited about getting a little drink for her garden. Uh, but she's been over here to the state many times, uh, has been here to our farm uh, numerous times as well. So we just have the utmost respect, not only for uh, her as a person, but certainly her as a scientist and the knowledge that she brings. And one of the things that we really appreciate about her is that even though she's a scientist and knows all these sciencey things and everything, she really speaks farmer language and, and it, uh, she resonates with the producer. And so that's the, one of the things that we've just always enjoyed uh, about her is how practical she is and in, in the information that she's bringing to the table. So uh, with that, I am gonna get out of the way and I'm gonna jump right in and listen with everybody else to, to because this, this topic today, the talk today is a brand new one that I have never heard. Uh, so I'm really excited about hearing it. So. Uh, Dr. Jones, take it away. Thank you very much, Keith, and thank you, Noah, and uh, great to um, meet everybody online. Uh, I've, I had a go at, um, this is called The Secrets of the Soil Sociobiome. So I've been reading all kinds of really in-depth uh, ecological articles about the science of how microbes communicate with each other and communicate with plants and how plants communicate with each other. And then I thought, now, how am I going to put this into something that uh, actually translates to, uh, <laughs> um, you know, something that's understandable? So I've, I've had a go. Um, and this is the first time I've actually given this um, webinar as well, The Secrets of the Soil Sociobiome. So we'll see how we how we go. Um, sharing screen with the technology. Um, it just takes a little minute. Sorry to oh, come on, move away. It's not letting me do it. You are screen sharing. Yeah, I know that. Ah. Oh. 
What's the matter now? I can't get into the bit that I need to get into. Go away. Would you believe this? Sorry, everybody. It's not actually letting me. There's something up the top. I can't get in. Okay, let's see what happens if we do this. Can you see that? Can you see that? Yes. Noah? Yep. Oh, okay. yep that looks good. I'm really sorry. I don't know why all the icons that would normally show up the top didn't want to show for me. So let's just see if I can now. Um, is, is that the next one? You can see the next one. It says soil is by far the most biologically diverse material yes. on there. Yep. Uh, okay. So we're away. All right. So um, secrets of the soil sociobiome. Uh, so soil is incredibly biologically diverse and uh, it's got all kinds of critters in it. I, I'm sure that everybody that's watching this today recognises this fact that there, there are all kinds of amazing things in soil. It really is the last frontier when it comes to science. And biodiversity in all of our ecosystems, not just in our soil, is actually the key factor in the effective functioning of, of living systems. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about, you know, the ocean or, or a rainforest or on our farms uh, or in the soil, biodiversity is actually the, the key factor we're realising more and more as we look into the science of these things. And in terms of soil biodiversity, um, it is so important for nutrient cycling, for moisture retention, for resistance to pests and diseases, for crop and pasture productivity, for food security, landscape function in terms of, um, we were just chatting before this session started about um, Australia's just had massive droughts and then massive floods. And, um, and it's also very important for carbon sequestration. Well, I'm not going to go into any of those things in any particular detail today. I mean, I'm sure you're all very well aware of why soil biodiversity is important. Um, we're just going to go on and actually look a little bit more into, well, basically, yeah, the secrets of the soil microbiome. Um, but the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United States has estimated that the socioeconomic value of soil biodiversity exceeds $1,542 billion, which all I can say about that is that it's an awful lot of money. Um, but it, in other words, this is very valuable. Well, the things that are going on in the soil that we really don't know very much about are very important for us. So, so far, so good. Soil biodiversity is important. Um, even the Food and Agriculture Organization has recognized that uh, it's, worth, um, it's worth dollars. But, but how do you get it? This is the practical part of the equation. Um, how, how do we know that we have biodiversity in our soil? And if we don't have it, how do we get it? Well, there's lots of issues with, with uh, trying to figure out what's actually going on in our soils. One of those is that less than 1% of soil microbes are culturable. And what that means is that you can take some soil and um, you could put it into petri dishes in a laboratory or something and you could provide food for microbes and less than one percent of the microbes that were in that soil would actually grow in that medium so we can't culture them in a laboratory we can't study them it makes it very very hard to know what is actually in your soil if 99 percent at least of the microbes there refuse to cooperate in terms of uh, allowing us to study them. So number one, they can't be cultured in a lab, most soil microbes. Uh, and number two, the majority of microbes in the soil at any one time are actually in a non-active state. In other words, they're dormant, um, which again, that makes it very hard to be able to detect um, unless they've, they've been activated by something. So the soil microbiome or the soil sociobiome is very difficult to study. And that difficulty has led us up several garden paths or to, <laughs> taken us down the wrong track many times. Um, we've had to rely on models and we still are relying on models to some extent to try and model what is actually going on in the soil. Um, and the, the models that we've used in the past are haven't really been correct because we haven't had the technical skills to actually detect what was in the soil. Now, in 1987, there was a, um, a, a paper published, which is called the Classic Soil Food Web Model. Um, H.W. Hunt was the, the lead author of that, but um, there was quite a few authors on that paper. And that Classic Food Web Model 
unfortunately is still being used and still appears actually in a lot of USDA publications, but it was theoretical, it was based on estimates. It was basically a theoretical calculation of the nitrogen transformations that take place in the soil through what was called the detrital food web, or if you like, the decomposer pathway in the soil. In other words, you have certain organic compounds in soil, like soil organic matter, for example, um, and it's broken down initially by fauna in the soil and, and it's sort of broken into smaller and smaller and smaller components and goes through, well, basically a food web where everything eats everything else. And nitrogen was thought to be released in the soil through that pathway. And some nitrogen definitely is released into soil through that pathway, um, but it is not the main pathway um, in soil. And I'm going to talk about nitrogen in a couple of weeks time, we've got this going to be a webinar called the nitrogen solution. And I'll go into that in more detail, but we have become really hung up on this uh, classical soil food web model, which in actual fact is now being shown through uh, the advances in technology we have now is, is substantially uh, revised. So there are, you know, lots of articles about, you know, soil food web revisited and soil food web challenged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So empirical studies, in other words, where we really do have data to go by, have found that if we're looking at carbon cycling, um, if we're looking at nitrogen transformations in soil, that most of these take place through the fungal energy channel. So it's not through the herbivory of um, bacteria, for example. Some does go through that channel, but the fungal energy channel is the one that's really important. And the fungal energy channel, the main fungal energy channel begins with labile carbon in the form of plant root exudates. In other words, we're talking about um, hundreds or sometimes even thousands of different carbon compounds that come out of plant roots for various reasons, sometimes to feed microbes, sometimes to, uh, to signal to microbes. And how do we know that that fungal energy channel is operating? Um, we look to see whether the roots of our plants have rhizo sheaths. In other words, whether they have soil sticking to the roots. And then we know that that fungal energy channel is actually open and that the plant is actually channeling energy out into the soil ecosystem. I've showed this slide many, many times and I probably will show it many more times because one of my favourites, um, this is a high magnification uh, photograph of what that actually looks like inside a riser sheath. You can see there are lots of fungal hyphae in there and they're not necessarily symbiotic fungi. In other words, they're not necessarily mycorrhizal fungi or trichoderma or other uh, fungi that form a very close relationship with plants. The more research um, that's been conducted, the more we've been able to see that a lot of them are what are called saprotrophic fungi. So they're basically just feeding off those sugars that are coming out of plants. And it has been thought under the classic food web model that fungi um, derive most of their energy from uh, sort of lignaceous material or materials that are difficult to, to, um, to decompose, like woody materials and uh, things that, um, that bacteria, for example, are not able to access. That's thought to have been the fungal pathway. And certainly you do see fungi decomposing those kinds of material. And, and then it has been thought, well, if you wanted to have more fungi in the soil, you would have to have more of those um, less readily decomposable type materials in your soil. Well, the science shows that in fact, the most uh, prominent fungal energy channel is actually labile carbon the kind of carbon that was thought to be uh, what bacteria feed on. It feeds enormous uh, numbers of fungi and many, many varieties of fungi. And the more we look into it, the more we realise that these saprotrophic fungi are very, very important. And they are um, moving carbon, well, moving labile carbon away from plant roots out into the soil food web as well, not just using it for themselves, but also feeding bacterial colonies. And in fact, we now know that the hyphae of fungi have their own uh, bacterial rhizosphere, if you like, in the same way that plant roots have um, a, a sort of a coating of bacteria around them of bacteria that are actually feeding on exudates from the plant roots. 
the fungal hyphae that are associated with plant roots also have a coating like a biofilm of bacteria around them that are feeding on exudates from those uh, from the hyphae themselves. So the hyphae exude carbon as well as the roots exuding carbon. So it's worlds within worlds. The, the closer we look, the, the more we see. And this is a, a lovely, I think I did show this one in the phosphorus paradox, um, a high magnification uh, view of, of plant root with all the exudates around it. And you can see some of these droplets of exudate here are being cradled by fungal hyphae. Now that, they could be any kinds of fungi. There's a whole lot of really beneficial fungi around plant roots, unless we're using fungicides, of course. And it has been shown that fungicides, uh, of all the poisons that you would use on plants, fungicides are the most detrimental to the soil because of course, they are preventing this entire fungal energy channel from even getting started. Um, and th this is a very, very well-known slide. I've used it hundreds of times. Other people around the world used it hundreds of times from the Aberdeen Mycorrhiza Research Group. It's quite an old slide, um, but it just very neatly demonstrates how the hyphae, in this case of ectomycorrhizal fungi, can um, move energy that's coming from photosynthesis being channeled into the soil by plant roots and can actually distribute that. Um, they are the highway and the internet of the soil. Um, and we, you know, we know this about mycorrhizal fungi, but we have to start thinking about lots of other kinds of fungi as well that we can't see as easily as we can see these ectomycorrhiza. And this is a close up of a plant, plant roots coming down the center of the photograph here. And then everything else that you can see in that photograph are the hyphae of, uh, in this case, ectomycorrhizal fungi, but they can certainly uh, have a wonderful network throughout the soil. So this fungal energy channel is the key pathway um, to support biodiversity in the soil because these fungal hyphae are keeping most other soil organisms alive through their uh, energy networks. And also joining plants through common mycorrhizal networks. If I have time at the end of the presentation today, I'll just give a little example of that. Um, but messages can be transmitted from one plant to another through these hyphal networks as well as uh, energy, as well as uh, water and nutrients. So the whole process of photosynthesis and plant root exudates are recognized as constituting the primary pathway for soil building. So if you're still thinking in terms of the classic soil food web model, <laughs> you need to just put that one aside and, and think about this fungal energy channel. Um, so here we have a plant in the center of the diagram here with the root exudates coming down this primary pathway. It does, the exudates do have to, to move through the microbial pool and we'll talk about microorganisms a little bit more in, in a while. And this is at this stage, it's all labile carbon, um, but it is going to be processed through the soil microbiome. And we want it to end up as being stable soil carbon down here. And our fungi and our bacteria, um, in this instance, it's been called the microbial carbon pump are very important for the transformations that take place. So over here on the left-hand side where we have leaf litter and um, um, decomposing roots and there might be animal manures or there could be compost or whatever the um, sorts of organic matter, actual matter itself, that's composed of lignin and cellulose and hemicellulose, that decomposition pathway does feed into the um, stable carbon pathway in the form of the enzymes that microbes use while they're decomposing these materials can actually stimulate this other liquid carbon pathway, but it is peripheral to, to the main pathway. It's important, um, but uh, what's happened now? You know, this is crazy. I've actually lost. I'm, I must have touched something. Noah, <laughs> I don't know what to do now. Is it just uh, froze? No, I think I must have moved my pointer and touched something. It's come up with a Zoom message. It's got a leader in the 2020 Garter Magic Quadrant Meeting Solutions. I think I'm. <laughs> I might have to stop share. What can yeah. you guys 
if you need to stop sharing here, I can maybe. And then I'll have to uh, share screen again, maybe. No, can you get rid of that? What's in the background? Oh, let me see if I can bring this up. Here we go. Slideshow. I don't know why I'm having all these technical problems. There we go. Should be right now, as long as I don't press on the wrong thing again. Can you see that now? Yes. Yep. Looks good on our end. Okay. So here's a close up um, of Scott Ravencamp holding a plant <laughs> that's um, an oak plant that's got had lots of exudates coming out of the roots and it's it's uh, created wonderful transformation for this soil, which over here on the left hand side, you can see that the soil in the absence of plants is very compacted and doesn't have any structure. So one of the important things about these exudates is what they can do to soil structure is a highly magnified view actually of some sand that's been incredibly improved um, through soil fungi being supported through the soil, um, through the liquid carbon pathway. So this has got nothing to do, this soil has had no plant residues or any organic matter added to it. The structure is just improved with fungal hyphae and um, the fungal energy channel. Over on the right hand side, we have soil that's well aggregated um, through that pathway. And on the left hand side, we have compacted soil where if our soil particles are, haven't been pulled together with fungal hyphae, then we won't have those lovely spaces between them for air and water to pass through. So we know that plant root inputs build carbon five to 30 times faster than carbon derived from above ground biomass. And this above ground biomass is of course, the basis of the classical um, soil food web model, which has now been, um, let's just say revised. So when our fungal energy channel is operating, um, this is a photo from Derek Axton's farm. It's a little durum wheat plant at a very young stage of growth. The seed is just here under my, um, under my pointer. We have this fantastic seminal root system that's getting down really, really deep in a very short amount of time and great rise of sheaths on the crown roots here of this plant. Um, and these plant root inputs, they're really the only way that we can build carbon at depth. We can put organic materials, like we can have our crop residues near the soil surface, or we can add compost or something at the soil surface. But if we wanna build uh, soils at depth, in this case, we're looking at about uh, 12 inches of depth, then we have to have plant roots uh, at that depth and we have to have plant roots that are actively exuding labile carbon for that fungal energy channel. So why have I used the term, the soil sociobiome for today's webinar? Well, it's because what is actually happening in that soil that we can't see, when we look at it, we just, well, basically we see a whole heap of dirt, I guess, <laughs> is that we, we can't see, unless we're looking for rhizo sheaths, um, we can't see that there's interactions taking place between plants and microbes. And there's also many interactions taking place between microbes and plants. Um, and I will, um, give an example of one of those right at the end and multiple interactions taking place between microbes and microbes. There's all these different uh, levels of things going on in the soil and really it is a social world. It's unbelievable um, the amount of the chemical messages, the biochemical messages and the signals um, that are going on. There's probably thousands of scientific articles now published on just exactly how all of that messaging works in the soil. Um, but all of the interactions between plants and plants, plants and microbes, microbes and plants and microbes and microbes, they all involve biochemical signaling. So you have to think of it in terms of, um, uh, of these mostly single celled things in the soil, little tiny cell, too small for us to be able to see with the naked eye. And of course, um, microbes, can't see, they can't hear anything, um, they can't smell anything. I mean, you know, they don't have any of the senses that we as a human being have to be able to detect our environment and react and respond to our environment. And the only thing that they can respond to, they can respond to temperature, they can respond to moisture, uh, and they can respond, respond to biochemical signaling. And the biochemical signals enable a microbe to know where it is in the soil and what it is that it needs to do, what its neighbors are, how many of them there are, and, uh, and, en and enables uh, microbes to actually coordinate their behavior 
and achieve all kinds of amazing things in the soil, like building aggregates, for example, or bringing nutrients to plants. Um, and these biochemical signals are very complex. There are thousands of them, um, and it's really quite an extraordinary world. I don't know any simple way to explain it really, other than there are um, every biochemical signal has a different shape. Um, in sh it's a shape in terms of what it's, uh, what it's made from, the atoms that it's made from, the elements that it's made from. Um, and it, those shapes will fit into receptor sites, both in the microbes that generated them and in other microbes that are able to receive them. And this is exactly the same way that biochemical signaling takes place in the human body or in any living system is that there will be um, biochemicals produced and organs, if you like, or cells that are able to either um, read those chemical signals or ignore them. And if there is a receptor site, then the signals can be, can be read. I think I'll probably just leave it at that. Um, but this is basically how the thousands of different chemicals are sorted in the soil as to like, you know, when there are so many things living in the soil and so many things, the only way that they can communicate with each other is through biochemical signals. Um, it's just absolutely extraordinary how it all works. But when you stop and think about it, it works the same way in our bodies, in our human bodies. We have, you know, there's hundreds of different biochemicals floating around right now that are telling your liver what to do and your kidney what to do and your heart what to do. And, uh, and it's all regulated at, at that level without us really having to think about it. But what we do know about plants now with the technology that we do have and the fact that we're able to interpret some of these signals is that plants function at their best when there is many different kinds of microbes living around their roots. And the best way to achieve that is by having many different kinds of plants growing together. Because when we have them, um, every kind of plant is obviously supporting different kinds of microbes. And when we have the plants growing together, we want them to actually, uh, we want root mingling. In other words, we want the roots to be, to be mingled in the soil. They don't necessarily have to be touching each other, but the plants have to be close enough for the mycorrhizal fungi to be able to link them together in a common mycorrhizal network. And even though there are plants that are not mycorrhizal, like brassicas, for example, provided they're in a mix with other kinds of plants that are mycorrhizal, they will join into the common mycorrhizal network, although they don't contribute to it. Um, they are still part of it and they're still joined to the other plants through that network. So what effect does this root mingling of different plant species have on plant productivity, on immunity to pests and diseases, um, on tolerance to stress like droughts or waterlogging? Um, as I mentioned before, here in Australia, we've, we had massive droughts and now we're underwater and there's houses floating away and cattle floating away and um, but, but the things that live in the soil have to have to deal with all these stresses and, and these things come around in a cyclical nature um, all around the world that there's always various stresses that environmental stresses that plants have to deal with and microbes have to deal with as well. So given that plants are in an environment that can be quite harsh at times, and given that we, we expect our plants to be productive, we want to be able to harvest them or we want to be able to graze them, it's very important to know what effect uh, root mingling or the sharing of the sociobiome actually has on those, on those uh, functions. So in this diagram here, I know it looks rather busy um, and that's because I guess they're trying to put the plants a little bit in the background and bring the microbes to the foreground. On the left-hand side, we have a bean plant and on the right-hand side, we have a, a rice plant. So one is in the Fabaceae family and one is in the Poaceae family. And to get the maximum benefit from root mingling, we really want our plants to be in different families. So when I talk about putting different kinds of plants together, I mean plants that have got different functional trays or come from different plant families. <clears throat> so for example, if you wanted to put uh, six different kinds of plants together, there's not a huge amount of benefit of putting six different grasses together. If you could put plants from six different plant families, um, then that's going to, to be much more beneficial. 
So, sorry, I just have to. <clears throat> These days when I'm not um, doing so many workshops and things, I don't get to use my voice a lot. Uh, so on the left um, left hand side, we have our, our bean plant. <clears throat> and you can see that there's a whole lot of microbes around the roots and they're obviously the rhizosphere <coughs> microbiome. There's also microbes, microbes all over the plant uh, on the leaves and the stems and the flowers and the fruits. And they're the, um, that's the philosphere microbiome. And then we have the endophytic microbiome, which is all the microbes that are actually inside the plant, the endophytes. And the more we look at these um, microbial interactions, the more we realize how important endophytes are. And most of the endophytes that are in the plant have actually come from the soil. So the plant has taken them up from the soil for some reason, for something that the plant needs. And quite often that could be uh, to help the plant to deal with the nutritional stress of some kind or to deal with an environmental stress of some kind. It will take from the soil sociobiome, if you like, what it needs. Now, if we have different kinds of plants growing in close enough proximity for them to be able to share those microbes, what we will find is if there's different kinds of microbes under one kind of plant um, that aren't, aren't under the other or aren't in association with the other kind of plant, if they are able to mingle their roots or if they're able to be joined by a common mycorrhizal network, they're actually able to use the genetic material um, from, from another plant. So the microbes that are living in association with plants are able to, sh to um, the genetic material that's in those microbes is able to be used by the plants um, for stress tolerance and also for the acquisition of, of nutrients. So plant productivity is very much influenced by diversity, by the biodiversity of the microbiome. So if we have two plants the same, for example, two uh, corn plants or two wheat plants growing side by side, they're going to have very similar microbiomes. In fact, probably going to have identical microbiomes. And that's going to have a negative a feedback effect on plant productivity the microbiome is going to be able to detect that the microbiome that's next to it or near it is the same as itself, and therefore it is a competitor. The microbiome is, is what will detect that this is competition. It's not the plant detecting that there's another plant it's competing with, it's the microbiome detecting there is another microbiome that it, it's competing with, and uh, it basically won't cooperate, won't share resources. If we have dissimilar microbiomes next to each other, so we have plants from different plant families um, next to each other, and there are six or eight plant families that are quite commonly used in agriculture. There's no reason why you can't have six or eight plant families together. Um, that will have a positive feedback effect on plant productivity. And you'd wonder, well, why, why would that be that the microbiome, when it detects that other microbiomes in its vicinity are dissimilar, why would it be that it will actually cooperate rather than uh, than refuse to cooperate? You know, what? Why? Why does it cause that change? It's a change in behaviour by the dissimilarity. The more dissimilar they are, the more they will cooperate. And this is because if we think of a a diverse plant community like a native prairie or something like that where we have lots of different kinds of plants growing together they will have different functional traits in other words they will respond to different environmental uh, stimuli some may grow well when it's hot some may grow well when it's cold some may prefer it um, when there's lots of soil moisture others could be very drought tolerant and that means that at some time of the year, almost any time of the year, there will be something that is able to grow. And if there is something in that plant community that is able to grow at most times of the year, and all the plants are connected underground by a common mycorrhizal network, as well as other networks, that's the one that we're most familiar with, but we now know that there's a lot of networking going on in the soil, then it means that there is energy coming into that microbial network continuously year round. If you only have one kind of plant there, it's only going to grow productively at one time of the year or under one set of environmental conditions. And for the rest of the year, the microbes in the soil basically starve. 
So it is to the benefit of the soil microbial community to have as many different kinds of plants there as possible. And the microbial community at some level is able to detect that. And if the microbial community detects that there is a lot of difference between the plants, in other words, the plants have dissimilar microbiomes, they're using dissimilar uh, chemical messages, then the microbes uh, cooperate and they have a positive feedback effect and they actually support each other. And this cooperation between the microbiomes not between the plants, between the plants' microbiomes actually has uh, an effect on plant productivity. Oh, just jumped over a slide and I'm not really sure how to, how to go back. I'm not having much luck with my techniques today. So I have mentioned this um, Yana biodiversity experiment many, many times before because it's probably the classic biodiversity experiment. Um, it's run for at least 15 years in Eastern Germany. Um, and in this experiment, they had four functional groups of plants. So they had grasses, legumes, tall herbs, and short herbs. So there's two different kinds of non-leguminous herbs. Um, I think it's really important to get away from just grasses and legumes when we're looking at our mixes. And they had one, two, four, eight, or 16 different plant species, but remember that's four functional groups. So if they had 16 plants, well, let's say if they had eight plants, they didn't just have eight different grasses or eight different legumes. Um, there was four functional groups in there. So there would have been two species from each of four functional groups. And I think it's the four functional groups that's more important than, than the eight species. And they looked at biomass production and beneficial insects and microbial activity and water balance and carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus. And there's been hundreds of papers written out of this, this experiment. But um, this is just an overview of the site. You'll notice that there's a river the Yana River just running around the back of this experimental area here. And I'll mention why that's important in a minute. Um, but what they found is that when they had, uh, as, as the numbers of species all went up in their experiments, that they actually had a, a linear response in terms of plant biomass. So this is one species, two species, four, eight, or 16. And remember where you've got four species, they're from four different plant families where you've got eight, they're from four different functional groups, um, not just eight of the one kind of thing. And we've got this linear response. So the more and more diversity, the more functional diversity we have, the greater the biomass. And that's going to be really important for a whole lot of reasons. Doesn't matter whether it's crop biomass or whether it's pasture biomass, or even if you're just growing cover crop, um, for soil protection or for feeding the soil microbiome, the more biomass you have, the more photosynthesis you're going to have uh, and the more that fungal energy channel is going to open. And in fact, there, it has been shown that there is a direct relationship between uh, plant diversity and soil fungi. So forget all the stuff about fungal to bacterial ratios of one to one or whatever people talk about, you actually want them to be a lot more than one to one. And the way to open that fungal energy channel is through plant diversity. So over here on the left, we have just plants of two different functional groups. So it could be a grass and a legume, for example. You will only ever be able to build soil to a certain depth with that limited amount of diversity. Over here where we have four functional groups and eight species, um, they're able to build this community is able to build much deeper soil um, because these microbiomes are actually cooperating. And this deeper soil proved to be very beneficial when that river did flood and the whole experiment went underwater. And it was sitting in water for, um, there's several feet of water there, it was sitting in there for, for actually for several weeks. And the scientists thought that the entire experiment was going to be destroyed, um, but they found that the the, the, uh, the mixes that had the high diversity survived perfectly well, the waterlogging, whereas the monocultures didn't. And the other side of that coin is that drought tolerance uh, is much, much higher, where we have high diversity in terms of a lot of different functional groups. Again, your four functional groups. So what happens uh, when plants are in diverse communities is that they can respond to the drought by recruiting microbes from the microbiomes of dissimilar plants. 
This is where your dissimilarity becomes very, really, really important um, in extremes of, um, in climatic extremes, this is where diversity really comes to the fore. Because for example, in a drought situation, you may have a plant that, <clears throat> a species that of its own is not really very drought tolerant, but if it's growing next door to something that um, does have better drought tolerance, it's able to recruit microbes from beneath that, that other plant. And when those microbes um, come as endophytes, they're taken up through the roots and they move into the plant, actually living inside the plant. So the plant has to feed them. So it means it has to photosynthesize more and produce more energy to actually like these have become uh, borders or lodges, if you like, within the plant and the plant is feeding those microbes. It's not gonna do that unless it, it, uh, it has a benefit from, from them being there. And those microbes will be able to bring about physiological changes within that plant that the plant's not able to bring about itself. For example, just produce enzymes or something that might uh, thicken cell walls, um, reduce the amount of moisture that's lost through transpiration and those kinds of benefits. There's a lot of literature on this, on how endophytes, beneficial endophytes can actually uh, provide drought tolerance to plants. So it's not a genetic thing, it's a microbial thing. And it comes again through diversity, um, through the sharing of this, this um, rhizosphere microbiome, and we need to have root mingling for that, for that to happen. So the higher productivity that we see in diverse plant communities is due to a, a whole lot of different factors. Um, as Noah mentioned before, it's sort of, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. We, we need to put all the different things together. You can't say it's just any one thing. For a start, we have, if we have lots of different families of plants then we're going to have variation in leaf, leaf architecture, some things like the grasses, for example, are just going to have uh, fairly narrow leaves sitting at say a 45 degree angle that really don't catch a lot of light. Other things like sunflowers are going to have, you know, big wide open leaves that do um, collect a lot of light. So this variation in leaf architecture results in more light interception. And that means that um, photosynthesis is going to be proceeding at a higher rate. We have a higher photosynthetic capacity, which means there is going to be more carbon ex exuded into the soil. And more exudates means more microbes and more microbes is access to a larger gene pool. So when I say more microbes, I mean more different kinds of microbes because we have different kinds of plants. And then that's very important for, uh, for soil structure, for aggregate formation, because uh, different kinds of bacteria and fungi and plant roots and plant root exudates and everything work together in a coordinated way to actually form aggregates. Um, nitrogen fixing, which I'm going to talk about, I'm talking about free living nitrogen fixing, and I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a couple of weeks time. Um, disease resistance, frost drought and flood tolerance, all of these things come through microbial diversity, which in turn comes through um, plant community diversity. And these diverse systems are self-organizing. So the microbes actually know what to do. Um, and they know what to do because they have such complex um, signaling mechanisms that we're only just starting to figure out actually how this signaling works and how, how microbes produce these different signals, how they respond to them, how they know which ones to respond to. Um, so <laughs> yes, it, it really is a very, very complex world under our feet, but it is a very, very well-organized world. So just to give you one example of, uh, I was saying that there's a whole lot of different levels of interaction. There's the interactions that we're most commonly, uh, that are most commonly spoken about or that we've been aware of for the longest time have been the interactions between plants and microbes. We know that plants produce signals that stimulate various microbes and they stimulate microbes that they need um, for certain purposes. Microbes also produce signals that can have either positive or negative effects on plants. So it can work both ways. And microbes also produce signals that can have positive or negative effects on other microbes. So we have all these levels of conversation going on. And um, I just wanted to give you one example. I think I may have mentioned this before in other webinars, but I haven't spoken about it recently, but it's the, the networking that goes on between trees 
in a forest, which is often attributed to the trees themselves, um, but it has nothing to do with the trees really, other than the fact that they're photosynthesizing and it has everything to do with the common mycorrhizal network. So this is one example here of, <clears throat> we have a paper birch on the left-hand side and a Douglas fir on the right-hand side. The Douglas fir, um, you'd be more familiar with these trees than, than I am, um, these Northern hemisphere trees, but the Douglas fir is going to remain it's evergreen. It's going to be able to photosynthesize at various levels throughout the year. Over on the left-hand side, we have a paper birch, which is going to lose its leaves in winter. Now these trees are joined underground by a common mycorrhizal network. Um, and the fungal network in the soil is receiving all of its energy from photosynthesis. So in summertime, when the paper birch has got uh, leaves that capture a lot more light than the Douglas fir, most of the energy coming into the system is actually going to be from the paper birch. But the fungal network is channeling energy to this, in this case, a seedling of a Douglas fir, which is being shadowed by the paper birch in the summertime when it has leaves. So the seedling of the Douglas fir wouldn't be able to survive in the summertime because there wouldn't be enough light unless the fungal network kept it alive. And this is often attributed to the tree actually being very benign and keeping another tree of another species alive. But it is the fungal network that is keeping a tree of another species alive. So why should the fungal network care whether a Douglas fir seedling survived or not? Well, it's going to care because in wintertime, when the paper birch doesn't have any leaves and it's not photosynthesizing, the only energy that can come into that common mycorrhizal network is going to be from Douglas fir, which are photosynthesizing over winter. So it's a very simple example of just two species, but to show you the uh, incredible power of the common mycorrhizal network and why the common mycorrhizal network actually behaves in that way, because it is to the benefit of the microbes to keep as many different kinds of plants alive because it, that is going to ensure that there's going to be energy coming into the system um, for as, as many parts of the year as possible. So when you, you ask the question, who, who is directing traffic here? Um, it is actually the microbes that are controlling what's going on, even though um, we look at those trees, like absolutely huge trees, and the energy that's moving around in the soil under those trees is being directed by microbes. So that was really all I wanted to say about uh, the soil sociobiome because the chemistry of it can get incredibly complex. Um, I guess if we look at things like insects, we probably see that there's extraordinary chemical signaling going on between insects and plants and plants and insects and insects and other insects I mean, isn't it amazing how um, pollinators can find, they can go to a flower and then they can go back and um, tell others where the flower is and then they can, they can all go find their way back even though it could be miles away. I mean, the, you know, the signaling that we see in other ecosystems is just as extraordinary as the signaling that goes on in the soil, but we can understand it a bit better when it's something big that we can see. Um, and we understand that um, it's very complex but it is also extremely well organized. So in the soil, it is also very complex, but, but extremely well organized. And in the same way that um, it, insects and, and plants seem to be able to manage everything above ground, um, microbes and plants. And there's also, of course, fauna in the soil, all our invertebrates in the soil manage to get themselves organized. And most of it is through um, some kind of, of uh, biochemical signaling. So that was all I really wanted to, to say in technical terms. Um, I'm happy to, to answer questions now. Not sure what I have to, I think I have to um, stop sharing or do something. What have I nope. done now? Looks, I can see you here just fine now. Um, I'm gonna use my privilege as the moderator and start off with a question that I have as far as, um, 
I've heard the argument made as far as interseeding, uh, which seems to be a hot topic over here of people planting cover crops into their corn. I've heard the argument made that interseeding is maybe not the best idea because corn is still providing the most carbon. So carbon being the most, um, I don't know if you say beneficial uh, for building soil organic matter, but carbon being the main um, factor there. But in what you're saying, it really isn't so much about the carbon as much as the root types of having that cover crop in with the corn. Do you have any kind of thoughts on that? Would you argue against interseeding because carbon is more important than the sociobiome? Uh, so, no, what you're saying is that there are a lot of exudates come out of corn roots, you're saying, so that you could actually theoretically build soil faster. Uh, that really is going to depend on how the corn is grown because there's been some long-term studies that have been done in the United States. I think they were done at, um, I'm going to say, Illinois University. I'm not quite sure. They're called the Morrow Plots. I think the Morrow Plots are in Illinois. And those long-term studies were with corn, but where nitrogen fertiliser had been used with corn, and I think that was something like 50 years or 70 years or some, some incredibly long time, the soil carbon levels had gone down. Um, even though corn has the ability to produce a lot of root exudates, if it's grown with nitrogen fertiliser, that's not necessarily the case. You can still be losing soil organic. Uh, soil, soil organic carbon levels can be going down. So root exudates don't necessarily translate into stable soil carbon unless they are stabilised in the soil. And in order for the root exudates to be stabilised in the soil, they have to be to undergo microbial processing from lots of different types of microbes. And if you have a diverse plant community, you'll have all the different kinds of microbes that you need to actually stabilize that carbon. It's all, all very well putting it there, like having, having exudation, but exudation doesn't necessarily translate through to stability. So yes, diversity is very important. And I think you'll find that where people are interceding corn, um, especially I think in the wide rows, I can see that that's gaining popularity, that you will definitely see much better uh, improvements in soil structure, which is an indicator of soil carbon building. If, you, if you're getting uh, more aggregate stability, then that's, co that's coming through carbon, uh, it's, it's carbon products that are actually the glues and gums that are sticking the soil particles together are soil carbon. Okay. Yeah, you could you could grow massive like like let's say you had irrigation and massive amounts of N, you could produce really high yielding corn and still have soil that's going backwards, which we know is which is over time why soil in many um, monoculture corn situations the soil is losing structure, it's becoming compacted over time, it's having all these um, you know soil degradation issues of a whole range of things. Yeah, it, it just just because carbon has the ability to exude, uh, just because corn has the ability to exude a lot of carbon doesn't necessarily mean it builds soil, especially as a monoculture. Okay. Uh, so I will open this up then to anybody else that has any questions. Uh, we have about 40 minutes here, so we've got plenty of time to get to those. Um, Clay asks, what are the main challenges in pasture context to making use of the nutrients in the atmosphere above ground is making use of atmospheric nutrients a goal worth pursuing i'm not really sure what she means by atmospheric nutrients because the only um well if you consider carbon to be a, a nutrient it's a trace gas 0.04 percent um, obviously that's a trace gas that we want to get into the soil so photosynthesis is going to be absolutely key to that so with pasture, if you're talking about pastured livestock, uh, definitely you want uh, your four functional groups in your, in your pastures. You, you want to really be looking at your non-leguminous herbs in there, as many of those as possible. Um, the only other element in the atmosphere that would be important would be nitrogen, obviously. 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen, and you'd, you'd also be wanting to try to get as much nitrogen into the soil as possible, and that's going to come through maximizing or optimizing photosynthesis because the more root exudates you have, the more micro the free living nitrogen fixing uh, microbes are going to be activated. 
through photosynthetic capacity, through photos through uh, through root exudates. But the, I can't think of any other nutrients that would be in the air other than carbon and nitrogen. Okay, um, this was in reference earlier. You were talking about fungicides. So Jacob asked, were you referring to fungicides both foliar applied and seed applied? Uh, especially seed applied, uh, obviously the most detrimental because we want a newly emerging seedling to be forming relationships with resident soil microbes and we really want it to be pumping out exudates like a seed will start to feed microbes in the soil even before it's produced any leaves. Um, but foliar fungicides are also detrimental and I mean all the research shows that the, the most detrimental um, chemical to uh, the soil microbiome are uh, fungicides or the most detrimental chemicals, plural, are the fungicides. And, and if you have um, a sufficiently diverse soil microbiome, you actually won't need fungicides. Mm -hmm. When plants are attacked by fungi, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of lack of diversity in the soil microbiome. It's a symptom. If you, a plant would be able to protect itself or it would be able to take up microbes that would um, help it to protect itself if it had access to those microbes. So it's really all about stimulating the soil microbiome rather than using a fungicide. Okay. Uh, can you recommend any key uh, research papers that would address the idea that the soil food web is incomplete or insufficient? Um, certainly I can, and I can send them to you, um, Noah, if, and then people can access them from you. There's been a whole series of it's mostly been undertaken in the UK. Um, in fact, there's a whole book, I think, <laughs> but there, there's certainly been um, some of those, you know, what's like a big review. Um, a review will come out where there may be, say, I think the one I, was look, one I was looking at last night, there was 12 chapters in it, and each chapter was written by somebody who was um, an expert in their field about their view of the soil food web and how the soil food web works. And all of 12 chapters in this um, review were looking at the um, fungal energy channel and the, um, and the labile carbon inputs. And all of them have used terms like um, soil food web revisioned or soil food web challenged or uh, classic soil food web um, obsolete or whatever. So the classic soil food web which unfortunately is still promoted in a lot of literature today, has been shown to not function as it was thought to, or to function in a very minor way. I mean, yes, uh, protozoa do consume bacteria, and yes, they do release some nitrogen in that process, but that's not the, that's not the principal pathway in soil. Okay. Um, Stephen I'll asks, them. oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Yeah. I mean, not now, <laughs> I can't do that, but I'll send it to you at the end of this. <laughs> okay, that'll be perfect. And not, if anybody wants, <laughs> if anybody wants that, I can email it to them. Uh, my email is noah at greencoverseed.com, but I'll also include that probably in the description on the YouTube page on the website as well, so that people can all access all that. Uh, Stephen asks, if we plant a polyculture of root systems, 16 or more, can we quit using fertilizers cold turkey? And how, how quickly can we wean ourselves off fertilizer if we can't go cold turkey? And I think you're gonna address some of this probably in the nitrogen uh, webinar, but if yeah. you wanna address that a little bit here, you can. Um, it's really hard to just kind of answer that without having seen the soil or seen the situation because there's often a whole lot of factors you know, in terms of like management was it a pasture? Did you say what were these 16 species? Is this a cover crop or a? Yeah, I'm not sure, Stephen. If you want to respond back and let us know what context yeah, you're putting I mean, this in. Yeah, I mean, there are some dairy farmers now, for example. Our dairies are um, all pasture based, so, you know, grass fed livestock. Um, they have gone cold turkey on nitrogen and they've put in something like 20 different plant species, but they're really making sure they've got those four functional groups in there. And, um, and they have been able to go cold turkey, but, it's a, but they're talking about a perennial system. They're talking about a really big emphasis on herbs 
not so much on grasses and legumes. And yeah, it's gonna depend what your 16 species are. It's gonna depend on whether this is just a short term. Are you talking about having an annual cover crop in there for six weeks or something? Or are you talking about something that's gonna be there for six months? Or are you talking about a permanent pasture that's gonna be there for you know, years? So the context is important to the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. When you say that it's best to have many kinds of microbes, do you mean genetic or functional diversity? And how do you measure that? Ah, uh, yes, I do mean I do mean functional diversity. So functional diversity in microbes, and how do you measure that? Uh, there's lots of. Uh, again, maybe I'll just send you a. How about I send you an article on that? How to measure? Because again, because we can't culture them. And the problem is that they switch their genes on and off as well. So when we do metagenomics type studies, it really depends what's active in the soil at the time. If you took a bacteria from the rhizosphere, for example, while it was in the rhizosphere, it would have certain genes uh, switched on, for want of a better word, and then you might move it like an inch away. Um, it is going to switch off the genes that it had switched on while it was in the rhizosphere, and it's going to switch on other ones. Um, bacteria do that, <laughs> they switch genes on and off. They also can transfer genes from one, um, one microbial cell can transfer genes to another one. You know, they, uh, yeah, we have horizontal gene transfer. We have all kinds of things going on in the soil that make it really difficult to actually figure out. Uh, but I can send you, uh, what, what was the, so what was the question? Functional diversity. Yeah, I'll send you something. So I'm gonna send you something on the challenges to the food web and something on functional diversity and all the new techniques that are um, being developed for actually measuring that. Okay. Uh, once a diverse crop is established, how long does it take to build or stimulate a diverse fungal ecosystem? A diverse crop. Again, I mean, this depends. Are we talking a cover crop? Or are we talking a perennial pasture? Uh, and it's a bit like, you know, how long is a piece of string? <clears throat> I mean, some of these changes can take place very quickly. We've certainly seen massive changes take place very quickly, but it depends on a whole lot of things, including the fertilizer regime. Um, you know, what sort of chemical residues are there in the soil? Does it have a, has it had uh, residual herbicides, for example, like atrazine or cinnazine or something? Um, you know, how dysfunctional is the soil when you start? What is the soil structure like? Soil structure is probably one of the most important things that you need to uh, improve in order for the soil microbiome to be able to receive water, to be able to uh, obtain air. Uh, if it's a very, very compacted soil, it's going to take a while to actually restore structure to the point where it can function. So you can't expect a miracle to happen overnight um, in a very um, dysfunctional soil. Okay. Uh, is there such, is there just as much synergy between woody and non-woody species in reference to the microbiome? I'm thinking of application of diversity in an already established pasture or sorry, in an already established orchard. So what was the beginning of that question again, Noah? Uh, is there just as much synergy between woody and non-woody species in reference to the microbiome? Um, there's, there's no doubt at all that, and again, we're going to be covering this in one of the webinars. We're going to talk about the use of cover crops in um, horticultural situations in vineyards and orchards. Um, so that, that is actually going to be the subject of an entire webinar. But yes, definitely uh, having non-woody species in the interrow, for example, if it was a, some kind of uh, like a vineyard or a, uh, an orchard where the trees were planted in rows and you're able to put a diverse cover in the interrow of very different kinds of plants can have enormous benefits for the woody species. I mean, I think the classic example of that, which is, um, I haven't actually read the article yet, but I'm, I'm aware of the, the subject was for the, um, the citrus, the citrus greening in Florida, um, where James, 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 help me, what was his second name? Anyway, uh, he, he has been putting diverse um, covers in his interrow and has completely eliminated any downsides from, from citrus screening. 
So you've still got the, the disease vector is still there. It's still present, but it's not having an effect on the plants because the plant's immunity has been improved by having those diverse covers in the interrow. So we will talk more about that when we do the horticultural session, but definitely, I mean, the, the, worst thing, the worst thing that you can have is a monoculture of anything, whether that's just a monoculture of one kind of uh, fruit tree or a monoculture of grapevines or a monoculture of corn or a monoculture of wheat or monoculture of one kind of pasture, you know, so, um, we, want, we, we need diversity in all of those systems. Um, is the sociobiome related to quorum sensing of microbes? Um, all microbes use quorum sensing, even in our own bodies. So in the human gut microbiome, the microbes in our gut use quorum sensing. Uh, the microbes in the rumen of a, um, you know, sheep or, or cattle, for example, use quorum sensing. Every microbe, every kind of microbe in every habitat on the planet uses quorum sensing. Um, so that microbe that's got a lot of us staying at home at the moment, <laughs> the virus, coronavirus, it also uses quorum sensing to express virulence. So when you first, uh, if you were to come in contact with that virus, it wouldn't have an effect on you until the numbers in your body reached a certain um, density and then it will become virulent. So you could go for a few days without realising that you had it, just the same as if you catch the flu or something like that. And if you've got a good immune system, you won't ever know that you had it. You could have it without knowing that you had it because it won't ever reach a quorum because your body will prevent it from doing that. So it's only when it actually reaches a quorum that it has an effect. So, so detrimental, uh, well, so pathogens, if you like, have to reach a quorum in order to express their pathogenicity or their virulence and beneficial microbes have to reach a quorum in order to be able to express their beneficial, um, they have a beneficial influence. So yes, quorum sensing is very important in all microbial communities, in all habitats, and for all kinds of microbes. Uh, Larry says, what are some primary research gaps within regenerative agriculture that would lead to outcomes that would benefit producers? Off the top of my head, I, I couldn't really say, sorry. I, I think, the, I think there's, uh, the, the biggest issue for people is actually moving away from high analysis fertilizers. I think there's just this huge fear of the wheels are gonna fall off <laughs> if we stop using nitrogen, for example, seems to be the classic. Uh, in the United States and uh, here in Australia, the big fear for, for our farmers is actually phosphorus. If we stop using phosphorus because our soils are so very old and deeply weathered that um, the phosphorus is tied up, it's locked up, it's locked up with iron and other elements in the soil and plants have difficulty obtaining it. And people worry that if they don't use phosphorus that nothing will grow. Um, in the United States, the big issue seems to be nitrogen, which we are going to talk about. Um, I think that's that's the biggest, well, from my perspective anyway, just off the top of my head, is actually getting helping people to transition away from using those kinds of products because they are definitely going to interfere with all that biochemical signalling that I was talking about that takes place in the soil sociobiome. All those different kinds of microbes and all those, um, they talk about different trophic levels, there's different um, energy channels in the soil and different trophic levels. They all need to function as a whole. Everything needs to be interconnected and those signals need to get through. They need to be produced. They need to be um, responded to. They need to be received and responded to. And that can't happen if we're using high analysis fertilizers. We just throw the whole thing out. We just, all those channels just become <laughs> um, totally disrupted. All those channels of communication break down when we use uh, either insecticides or fungicides or high analysis fertilizers interfere with that very intricate signaling that's going on in the soil. And I think the biggest fear that producers have is of moving away from something that they know works, even if it results in dysfunctional soil. At least they still get a crop. <laughs> yeah, and 
like you said, you will be addressing the phosphorus and nitrogen in the weeks to come. So um, like Gene asks, is there a fungi that can fix atmospheric nitrogen? I believe those are things that we'll be getting into uh, in future webinars. So any questions yeah. I think on that, we can probably touch on those. Well, I can answer that one today, Nara. There is not a fungi that can fix atmospheric nitrogen. It's only uh, bacteria and archaea are the only microbes that can fix atmospheric nitrogen. But there are hundreds of species of those that can fix atmospheric nitrogen. Can you repeat again what you said about genetic material from microbes being utilized by plants? How does the genetic material of the microbe actually benefit the plant? Okay, so what I, what I mean is that it would be genetic material that the plant uh, itself wouldn't possess. So the plant, uh, I, th I think drought tolerance is probably a classic example. And there's lots of, uh, lots of science on that as well. If you want me to send you one of those or a couple of those articles, people can read them for themselves. But for example, we have a, have a plant in a situation where uh, it's suffering from a moisture deficit. Um, it's not able to tolerate that level of uh, moisture deficit, so it's probably going to die. But if it has, uh, if it is able to take microbes up from the soil that have um, the ability to influence physiological processes within the plant that would help it to uh, to uh, utilize moisture more effectively. For example, um, there could be Plants can take up microbes that are that cause cell wall thickening, right? Cell wall thickening that within the plant, I mean, that wouldn't normally take place. It's because of some enzymes that the microbes are producing or some effect that the microbe is able to have on physiological processes within the plant. And the plant is selective, going to selectively take that microbe up from the soil only if it needs it. So if there's plenty of moisture, the plant will not have that microbe in its system. In a moisture deficit situation, the plant will signal to the microbe and will, um, what's the word for it? What is the word James White uses? Internalize it, actually internalize those microbes. It will signal to those microbes and attract them around the roots. And when the microbes are really close to the roots, they can be internalized at the root tips. They can be taken into the plant as endophytes Obviously the microbe is cooperating in that, it wouldn't allow the plant to take it, take it up unless it was a cooperative behavior. When it's inside the plant, it's gonna be fed and housed by the plant basically. So all its nutritional needs are gonna be provided by the plant. And in return for that, the plant's gonna expect something from the microbe. And what the microbe can do for the plant is change its physiology and change its physiology so that it is now more drought tolerant or more tolerant of um, the moisture deficit. Then if moisture was supplied and the plant no longer needed that microbe, it may stop supporting it and um, it's, not going to be, it's not going to be present anymore. So you could analyze a certain species of plant in a situation where it wasn't suffering from moisture stress and you would find that that particular microbe would not be in the plant. Then you subject the plant to moisture stress and you find that that microbe that changes the plant's physiology is inside the plant and it's taken it up from the soil. It's a microbe that normally lives in the soil. So what I mean by the genetic material is that the genes that the microbe possess that enable it to, um, because microbes can switch genes on and off in plants as well, as they can switch genes on and off in people. Um, microbes are very powerful <laughs> and the plant, Need, in a natural situation needs to be able to interact with the microbes in the soil to assist it in situations like that. But there is, there is plenty of literature on that. And I was just gonna add that to my list here. Um, I'll send you something and then you can just, if you wanna put those links up with the video or something, people can read more about it, like how it actually works. It, it sounds like you need to just write a book. Ah, uh -huh. yeah, right. <laughs> the problem is the book would, would, would be a different book every, every year because there's just so much information coming out that, I mean, it, not, not that the information wouldn't be right, but what we wrote last year, we, we'd know a lot more this year. Next year, we'll know more again. 
Yeah. And the number of particles that are coming out on the soil microbiome are just, it's just incredible. I How know much? the same thing with our, our resource guide that comes out every year and it seems to, we're always like, we got to keep it the same length, but there's always just new information that comes out and it's like, well, let's just add four, four pages and that turns to eight and we try to make as much space for you as we can. Uh, Annette asks, if your soil is compacted, compacted, how would you aerate it to get the microbes thriving again? Uh, yeah, again, it's going to depend on the situation. Is it a cropping situation, a pasture situation? Is it somewhere, is it arable? You know, um, I mean, people will use uh, soil aerators as a like a short-term quick start way of getting air into soil. I mean, obviously you need plant root exudates and you need microbial communities to, to rebuild aggregates, but the plants have got to be able to grow. Um, and if the soil is really compacted, you just won't be able to get plants established in there. So I don't have problems with uh, soil disturbance. If it's a one-off thing, you're doing something to actually get, you have to create an environment that plants can grow in in order for plants to be able to photosynthesize and produce exudates. Um, so, and you can't expect them to grow in something that's like concrete. The issue I have with soil disturbance is that someone will say, okay, my soil's like concrete, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna, you know, rip it up and power harrow it and, and everything. And then um, if they've done nothing about um, plant cover, keeping, keeping the soil covered and having, you know, diverse covers, then it's just gonna go back to being compacted again. And then they'll wanna come in and rip it all up again. So there's nothing wrong with doing that as a one-off and using it as a way to get a good plant establishment and then for your root exudates to come in and um, do the work after that. Okay. Uh, Robin says, I have very mineralized... You can't expect plants to establish a compacted soil. You Sorry, I think I had a little lag there. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> It seems that uh, I have mineral, mineralized soils, Robin says. Can you address whether that is a good thing or a bad thing and how I can address it if it's an issue? That's a term I never heard until I went to the United States. And I think mineralized soil means it doesn't have any organic matter left in it. In other words, it's just a whole stack of soil minerals. I think that's what he, what, what he means. Um, so, soil minerals is basically, that's just dirt. And it's not really fertile topsoil until we add organic matter or organic carbon, and that's going to come through plant root exudates. So if what he means by mineralized soil is soil that only has min, I mean, that's what soil is made from. Soil is made from minerals, but in order to have functional, high functioning soil, we want to have a whole lot of life in it as well as the minerals. And that life is going to come, can only come from plants really plants and their exudates and all the microbial communities that those exudates support. So I'm not exactly sure of that question, but if he's being told he has mineralized soil, I think what he's being told is it's dysfunctional. It just is just a whole pile of minerals and it doesn't have any life in it. Okay. Nisha says, if you had a magic wand and could do one thing to stop climate change, what would that be? I can't think of the name for that. There's a big uh, ocean current that circulates around the world. Some people call it the Atlantic conveyor, but it does have a more a scientific name than that. But the Atlantic conveyor is, is another word for it. And it, it moves, uh, actually, I think the Gulf Stream that comes up the east coast of the United States is part of the Atlantic conveyor and sort of brings warm, moist, us warm moist <laughs> obviously it's an ocean current yes it is but <laughs> warm water <laughs> up the east coast of the states and then um, at some point in the north it takes a deep dive and goes down um, and it sort of goes around and the Atlantic conveyor um, is the chief determinant of global temperatures so and there is evidence to suggest that that's actually slowing down and at some point that will stall and will reverse so that all the cold water um, will well up 
and come in the other direction. So down the east coast of the United States, for example, instead of having warm water coming up from the south, you're going to have incredibly cold water coming down from the north. And um, that will generate an ice age. Who knows whether that's going to be in 100 years or 1,000 years or 10,000 years. <laughs> but uh, the cliff chief determinant of global temperatures is the direction of that um, major ocean circulation current. So there's nothing I could do to change that. It's going to change all by itself. Okay, we have two questions in regards to uh, getting off synthetic fertilizer in regards to adding either bio fertilizers, the anaerobic um, was brought up as well. Do you have any thoughts on adding to your soil to get away from chemical fertilization? Uh, there is no doubt that you can stimulate the soil um, I, I don't, there's, in my mind, there's a lot of difference between a biostimulant and a biofertilizer. To, to me, and everyone defines this differently, but to me, a biofertilizer is something that you would use in place of a synthetic fertilizer. So you might use something like um, fish hydrolyse or um, a compost or something like that in place of using a synthetic fertilizer. I would call that a biofertilizer. Um, a biostimulant would be something that you would use to actually stimulate the microbes that are in the soil that are not active. So as I said, the majority of microbes in the soil are in a dormant state. And so one of the secrets, I guess, to the soil sociobiome is actually to activate those dormant soil microbes. And one way that we can do that is by using a biostimulant. And the best place to put a put a biostimulant is on a plant seed before you plant it. So what what would a what does a what would a biostimulant um, entail? A biostimulant will be some product that actually has a whole lot of those signaling molecules in it that I talked about that microbes use to communicate with each other. So if the biostimulant was um, worm leachate, for example, or vermi liquid or whatever word you want to use to, um, to describe that. It will be something that um, it has passed through the gut of, a, of an earthworm. So it's come through a fermentated or fermentative anaerobic environment that's absolutely um, chock block with a huge diversity of very active microbes. So there's going to be a lot of chemical signaling molecules in that product. So what, what it means is that you're going to be applying chemi the chemical signaling molecules that microbes use to communicate with it, each other. You're going to put those onto a plant seed. So as that seed is germinating, it is going to detect those signals because the only way that plants and microbes know what's going on in the soil is through mm -hmm. chemical signaling and it's going to detect those signals and interpret them to mean that it's in a very rich microbial environment. So it is going to respond by producing a lot more exudates to feed the microbes that its senses are there, even though the microbes aren't there. Um, because any microbes that you put into the soil are immediately going to be consumed by resident soil microbes. They're probably going to live for seconds, not even minutes. So if you put these microbial signaling molecules onto the seed, the plant will respond and feed them. So it's going to produce more exudates. And then when it produces more exudates, it is actually going to feed resident soil microbes that are going to respond in turn. And so you just set off a whole positive chain reaction um, of more microbes means a healthier plant can in turn photosynthesize more, can in turn produce more exudates, et cetera, sort of plant intelligence and microbial intelligence and the whole interaction between those two things is stimulated by a biostimulant. A biostimulant could be something that you could make on farm yourself. It could be, um, I mean, there's lots of, it could be something through Korean natural farming or it could be bakashi or it could be fermented compost or you could have a worm farm or you know, there's so many different ways that people can make biostimulants, but if it's a fermented environment that it was created in, then the abundance of microbes is going to be much higher than in an aerobic environment. So the uh, density of microbial chemical 
the chemical signaling molecules that you're applying is actually going to be higher. You're going to get more chemical signaling molecules from a fermented environment. Okay. Uh, in regards to interseeding cash crops and companion crops, is it best to do it in the same seed row or separate seed rows? Uh, this is in regards to what you mentioned with root mingling and stress tolerances. How close do those need to be? And do you have any kind of thoughts on how you would plant interseeding? Um, again, that depends a lot on what the crops are and what equipment people have. I know Derek Axton is, um, well, last time I was speaking to him anyway, he has sort of experimented with a whole range of either having plants in the same row or having them in separate rows. And for his purposes, he's found he's actually better off having them in rows side by side, um, that that's worked better for him. And because as long as the plants are, you know, as provided they're within a reasonable distance of each other, their roots are still going to mingle. They don't have to sort of be in the same row. Um, and they're going to be also joined by a common mycorrhizal network if they're, um, if, if at least one of the plants that is in there is mycorrhizal. If one of the species is mycorrhizal, then the whole um, field is going to become mycorrhizal. In some situations, for example, um, our corn growers in the northern part of the northern part of Australia is a hot part and the southern, southern part is down near Antarctica, that's a cold part. Uh, so we grow things like corn in the northern part. Um, they have found that if they plant soybeans in with their corn, that they don't need to use nitrogen fertiliser. They get exactly the same yield by putting soybean in as they do by putting, uh, not using nitrogen fertiliser. And they have found that the soybeans actually work best in the row with the corn. So they're planted in the same row with the corn because they don't care whether the soybeans grow very much at all. All they really want is for the soybeans to have um, their root exudates to be mingling with, with corn root exudates. So in that particular situation, they've found that having so soybeans and corn in separate rows doesn't work as well as having the soybeans in the row with the corn. And in that situation, it was just a matter of just throwing all the seed in together. Made it really easy. You didn't have to have specialised equipment or anything for, for doing that. So it's going to depend on, on the species. It's going to depend on um, your equipment. And it's probably going to depend on whether you intend to harvest with both of the crops or sometimes even more than two crops. You know, sometimes in polycrops, people are actually harvesting the separate the crops separately and separating or harvesting them together and then separating the seed, um, all those kinds of, or you could even have your example of like real out cropping where you're going to harvest both of them, but at very separate times, different times of the year, you're going to harvest one thing, you know, at a totally different time of the year to the other. So it's a very complex, situation and I, I mean that's a very rapidly evolving field that I think that that is the way the future of farming is definitely polycropping a whole lot of different um, variations on that that theme and we're seeing good examples of uh, companion crops companion cropping even where you're still only just going to have your one cash crop um, you're going to discard basically discard all of the other seeds but your cash crop is actually growing better um, and yielding higher when it's got companions in with it. And that's just all planted in together. It's not in separate rows, just all seeded in together. Okay, and I wanna be respectful of your time here so we don't go too long. Do you have time for a few more questions or do yeah, you need to sure. help? Yeah, I, I wasn't looking at the time, but yeah, no, that's fine. It's 11 o'clock, <laughs> 11 a.m. <laughs> I'll get to a couple more and then we'll let you get out to your garden because we don't want to stop you from doing any of that. Um, Claire says that you had, uh, you elaborated or can you elaborate on the fungal bacteria ratios not being so important? Uh, that was something that you mentioned people often are worried about, but can you speak to that a little uh, bit on why you don't think it's so important? No, I actually do think it's incredibly important, but I think it's really important that the there be more fungi than bacteria. Because in our healthy sort, where we're seeing where people are getting really good results um, when they do a biomass on the fungi and bacteria, they find they have more fungi than bacteria. I mean, the problem with the classic food web model is that for some strange reason, people are trying to keep that ratio at one to one. I've never really, like there's been a theory out there that arable crops and pastures are going to function better if that ratio is one to one. And if for some reason it goes over, 
So you have like say two to one, in other words, twice if the fungal biomass is double the bacterial biomass, people get concerned about it and start putting bacterial foods out like molasses and things trying to, uh, to increase the number of bacteria in soil. You want to get your fungal to bacterial ratio as high as you possibly can. Don't try and keep it at one to one. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I know a lot of them are less than one to one. Lots of there's plenty of situations where the fungal to bacterial ratio might be 0.3 to one or something. In other words, fungi 0.3 in to, to every one bacteria. Well, that's woeful. I mean, you but you want to get it right over one to one. You don't want to hold it at one to one. You want it to be two to one or three to one or you know, even higher, as high as you can get it, because those fungi are going to be, um, that's, that's your fungal energy channel. That's, that's like the pathway that's um, bringing energy into the whole soil ecosystem and feeding all your other microbial groups is through that fungal energy channel. So you have to just put out of your mind all that classic soil food web stuff because it's, um, it doesn't work. Empirical studies, you know, the science actually shows that that, model is outdated but people still clinging to that and thinking that they have to have this one-to-one -one ratio so this is kind of along the same lines of that um ratio but uh steven says that he has a new pasture that's producing well under regenerative grazing but it's developing more and more rose bushes is that because of a higher fungal soil and does he need to worry about rebalancing his bacteria to, to fungi yeah, I, I can't answer that question. I don't know whether that's the reason, but I do know that um, last year I was doing some work in Namibia, which is in Africa, a country in Africa, and they have uh, 60 million hectares, um, which I don't know what that is in acres, but just double it, <laughs> let's say 120 million acres, <laughs> it'll be close enough, of uh, degraded rangelands that has been encroached by uh, shrubs or bushes or whatever you want. They call it bush encroachment. In Australia, we call it shrub encroachment, but you would have to see the same thing in parts of the United States where um, range, you have things like creosote and those kinds of um, uh, shrubs or bushes come into what originally was, if you went back 100 years or so, were perennial grasslands that had been encroached by woody species. Let me just put it that way. Same thing has happened in Australia. Same thing has happened in many parts of Africa. And these people in Namibia were thinking that the reason they had bush encroachment was because uh, their, fun they, their soils were fungally dominant. I said, have you ever measured the fungal to bacterial ratio? And they said, no, but we've just read in the literature that everyone's talking about fungal dominance will create bush encroachment. And I said, well, it's your grazing management that's created the bush encroachment because all their good perennials have been grazed out of the system. And then the only thing that can grow there now are these um, deep rooted shrubs. So it's, you know, this hang up that we have about fungal to bacterial ratios has caused people to go down the wrong track, not look at the actual management issues that are um, creating the problem. And, and changing, trying to, I mean, ha I don't know how you can ever change fungal to bacterial ratios anyway, other than old oh, people will put bacterial foods out and encourage uh, bacteria to try and get a one-to-one -one ratio. It encourage it can are going to encourage all the wrong kinds of bacteria in their soils and probably lead to more soil compaction. And yeah, <laughs> it's it's the wrong model. It doesn't work, and it's not a cause of woody weed encroachment. Let me put it that way. There's something else that's causing that. If you want to call the rose bushes, uh, they are obviously an invasive woody shrub. Um, it's not due to fungal to bacteria ratios, no. Something else is causing it. Okay. So fungi network increases through diversity of plantings and you have a healthy microbiome. Do you see nutrient densities in plants also increasing? Yes. Definitely. That's what I was hoping that, you'd say. That was, the, that was the main reason you'd be doing that. <laughs> well, because at the end of the day, so at some point in time, we want uh, we want uh, producers to be rewarded for producing nutrient dense food because that will act as incentive to improve the soil microbiome. And will also improve hu human health, obviously, <laughs> to be a great thing. 
Um, where do all the fungal species come from once you have a diverse cover crop? Is there ever a need to apply microbiology through compost or compost tea? And I'm going to kind of add on to that because we get this question a lot of how long do I need to be applying inoculants or compost teas if I'm in a perennial system or if I'm continuous cover crops? Uh, so in your experience, how long do you need to be applying these things? Uh, again, it depends really. There's a lot of confusion about compost teas, compost extracts, if it's a brood tea and if people think they're applying microbes, I can tell you those microbes do not survive when you apply them to the soil. If you're just spraying them out on pasture or spraying them out on soil, um, they're, they're going to be consumed. It's just a food source that's going to be consumed by the soil, soil microbiome. Um, so I can't really answer that question. I think a biostimulant on a seed, if you're planting crops, a biostimulant on the seed is really beneficial because it really does kickstart um, that whole conversation basically between the plant and the resident soil microbes. A biostimulant by that, I mean you're putting the chemical signature of compost or the chemical signature of vermiliquid or something. You're just using those chemical um, biochemical signaling molecules. Um, in terms of uh, spraying things out on pastures, again, biostimulants, yes. Um, brood products, maybe not so much. Okay. Um, there was a question here, I just gotta find it about, yes, you talked about plant exud exudates being the main channel for the transfer of carbon compounds to the soil. Uh, one of the things that we're told here in regenerative ag is that you must integrate livestock or manure. Can you do that without uh, livestock and still increase soil carbon? Is the plant exudates enough or do you, yes. do you have to have the livestock component? No, yes, plant exudates are definitely enough. We're seeing huge improvements in soils with uh, companion planting and uh, multi-species covers in um, like, there's like in, in cropping areas where there are no livestock, definitely, yes. Diversity is the key there. Okay. Well, with that, I think we'll wrap up. I know that we have some questions that we did not get to, so I apologize for that. Um, the good news is we have Christine back with us next week and the following two weeks after that. So um, I did keep a record of all these questions, so we'll see if we can get those answered um, later on. But if there's something really pressing that you want to get to this week, feel free to send me an email. Uh, my email is noah at greencoverseed.com, and I will get those. Uh, well, I probably won't answer them, but I'll make sure that someone smarter than me gets them answered, and we'll get that over to you. Um, thank you so much for your time this evening. I appreciate you coming on and sharing with us. Thank you to the audience for all your questions. It was great uh, dialogue, and we look forward to seeing everybody next week. Uh, Christine, do you have any final thoughts? <laughs> um, I was actually thinking about my garden, Noah, sorry. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just coming up to... Um, just after 11 a.m. in the morning here, I was just looking out the window, the sun shining now. <laughs> Stop raining. It's, it's the but, perfect garden time. Well, we'll let you go, but thank you so much for, for sacrificing your time with us this uh, morning. That's right. But I, I am going to send you a couple of uh, links like to the soil food web information, um, to the functional diversity, like how do you measure functional diversity, and also to how do plants access genetic material from the soil microbial pool to assist with drought tolerance and those kinds of things. So I've just written myself the list. And as you said, if any other questions come up, we can, we've got other sessions that we can deal with those or I can send you further information for those. Uh, so until next time, I'll go, I'll go out and uh, get some functional diversity happening in my, in my vegetable garden. <laughs> That's right. Practice what you preach. Well, and I'll let you guys know next week is going to be uh, the phosphorus paradox. And we actually had Christine on, was it November to yep. do that? And so we recorded it. And what we're going to do is just, it'll be a replay of that webinar that we did, but she has been generous and kind enough to sacrifice her time to come on and answer some questions. That was obviously the reason we wanted to do this series. So she'll be coming on live. If you guys want to ask your questions there as well, next week, it'll be the same time at five 30. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next week.
Thanks, Noah. <laughs>